Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is H.R. McMaster, and it's a real privilege to be able to welcome you here to the Hoover Institution and Stanford University to discuss a very important study, a study entitled Chinese Influence and American Interests, a study that was, that was put together, co-sponsored by the Hoover Institution and the Asia Society of Northern California. This is an important report. It's an important report because it has deepened our understanding of a challenge, a challenge that is critical to preserving our free and open societies. So I thought what I might begin with is to ask us maybe to establish three goals for ourselves as we hear from those who authored portions of the report and put it together. The first goal might be to understand better the nature of Chinese Communist Party influence operations. What is motivating the broad range of activities that Chinese government and pseudo-government organizations are conducting? What are the goals of the Chinese Communist Party? And what are the elements of their strategy as they pursue those goals in the areas that are covered in the report? The federal government, state and local governments, the Chinese American community, universities, think tanks, media, corporations, and technology and research. A second goal might be to determine what is at stake and in particular, how and to what degree do Chinese Communist Party influence operations threaten the democratic principles, institutions, and processes that define our free society and other free and open societies? And a third goal for us today might be to determine what more might all of us do to implement constructive vigilance, to protect the integrity of American institutions inside the United States, while also protecting basic core American values, norms, and laws. This report is a model, I believe, of thorough research, impeccable analysis, and compelling argument. It deserves a wide readership, and I've encouraged those of you who haven't had the opportunity to read it, to read it. But it must not be read passively. Chinese Communist Party influence and American interests is a call to action, a call to action to those in industry, academia, think tanks, local government, and law enforcement, who must take responsibility for protecting our nation and our citizens from a sophisticated and pernicious form of aggression. Although this study is certain to inform policies at the national level, the problem, the challenge of Chinese Communist Party influence requires, above all, constructive vigilance at the local level. So what, I, what I'd like to do is introduce our panel members in the order in which they'll present. They'll each present for a brief period of, of time, and then at the conclusion of their remarks, we'll open it up for, for questions uh, from the audience. First, Orville Schell, who is a, an esteemed China scholar. He is the author of many books on China, including Wealth and Power, China's Long March to the 21st Century. He is the director of the Center on U.S.-China Relations at the Asia Society. Orville will discuss the motivation behind the report, what he sees to be the most important overall findings, and the concerns you will find in the afterword, which I know is on all of our minds, about avoiding generalized, indiscriminate suspicion of Chinese, Chinese Americans, and cooperation with China. Second, we'll hear from Liz Economy, who, who is the CV star Distinguished uh, Director for Asia Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations, and also we're very fortunate to have her here at Hoover as a Distinguished Visiting Fellow. She is the author of the excellent recently published book, The Third Generation, 
revolution. Sorry, sorry the, third, the third revolution. That's excellent. Xi Jinping and new, the new Chinese state. She'll discuss uh, the findings on think tanks and universities. Third, John Pomfret, who's a journalist and long-term, long-time student of China. He's the author of The Beautiful Country and the Middle Kingdom, America and China, 1776 to the Present. I'm reading it now as I just finished Liz's. I recommend both their, their books. Uh, John is going to discuss the findings on media and the Chinese American community. Fourth, Kyle, Kyle Hutzler of Stanford University, who has, has been a Schwartzman scholar. He's a former business consultant, and he's been working on U.S.-China relations since high school. He's going to, to talk about the report's concerns involving corporations. And, and fifth and, and finally, uh, Larry Diamond, who is, who is a senior fellow here at the Hoover Institution and at the Freeman Spogli Institute, and the author of, of many books that assess the, stat, the, the status and prospects of democracy around the world. He will discuss mainly the policy recommendations overall uh, in, in this study. So what, what I'd like to do is, is not delay any further, but just to ask you as you think about what questions you have, maybe jot them down. Please keep them as questions and not statements and make them very brief. And, and when we do go to the questions, uh, if you'd like to, you may uh, mention your name and affiliation, but that's, but that's not necessary. But, but without, without any further delay, I'd like to turn it over to Orville to kick us off. Well, thanks, HR, and thanks to all of you uh, for coming. Let me just very quickly uh, tell you a little bit about how this, uh, this working group, uh, and indeed it was a, a, a group of amazingly collegiate scholars all working uh, without pay uh, from around the world and this country to take a look at um, what we thought was a, a, uh, a topic that really needed our examination, namely, as China begins to become more powerful, more influential, and have greater and greater global ambitions in almost every realm of life that you can think of, whether it's civil society, media, military, church, uh, uh, diplomacy, they are expanding, uh, and legitimately so, around the world. But this has consequences. And nowhere, uh, we thought, uh, uh, more importance than within our own country in the sense of when normal activities which come under the rubric of public diplomacy begin to become more than just influence and become interference. And I think uh, we all understand that behind that question are two extremely different political systems and systems of value. And as long as we could presume that China was reforming, and here you see reform becomes an extremely important kind of catalytic agent in the whole US-China relationship. As long as China was reforming, it was possible to believe that we were becoming more convergent in a sort of a common uh, a pool of, of uh, global forms of governance, ethics, if not uh, political systems. But when China began to, to really slow the reform process, and indeed some would even say it's come to a halt, that sort of undermined the whole idea of engagement. And it became very difficult for us to just sort of ignore the fact that there were, was an, such an enormous disparity in how we choose to govern, to treat our citizens, and indeed now to project out into the world. And uh, what the study finds, and I do hope you'll have a chance to read at least those parts which you find interesting, is that more and more China's apparatus, which will be described in some detail here tonight, is substantial. Its resources considerable as it tries, seeks to elaborate itself and influence the dialogue around the world. And we thought that was worth understanding, uh, mapping the full dimensions of it. Now, yes, I completely understand the concerns. I have them myself. I think that there's not a person on this panel who isn't worried about America's history when turning against racial groups. We do it sometimes very mindlessly and totalistically. 
I was just in Washington over the last two days meeting with the uh, National Intelligence Council, State Department, Senate, Congress, uh, NSC in the White House, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, there is a phenomenon aloft in the land, uh, which is very surprising in this world of bipartisan, uh, of partisan discord, and that is a bipartisan common front on the question of China. That China now is perceived in a much more skeptical light than it was a year ago or two years ago. There really is no group in America anymore now that the businessmen have moved into a state of ambiguity that is sort of full, uh, full throttle in, in favor of no-fault relations. This is both an opportunity to change China policy, but it also presents a great danger. Because when Washington gets running before the wind, all in one direction, uh, we've had some experiences which I think are, are quite bitter. My own feeling in sitting in on those meetings and seeing this extraordinary bipartisan uh, uh, regalvanization of Washington was that I was glad we were there, that there was an outside group that could at once call attention to the problem. That's category one, understand it, map it, see its dimensions, come to an understanding of, of the degree of challenge it posed. And the second question is, what are you gonna do about it what are the consequences of what you might choose to do about it? And how will you mitigate it, the deleterious consequences of maybe seeming to turn against Chinese Americans, Chinese, or anything with a, a racial overtone of that kind, which I think nobody wants to see. Uh, that would be a horrendous outcome uh, for this, this report. So I, 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 I feel that we have two challenges. One is to expose the problem come up with some solutions, and then we have to uh, also be vigilant against uh, overzealousness. So we can talk about that more, but I want you all to know this is on our minds. We wrote a little afterwards, Larry and I, on this very topic because it is concerning. But this does not mean, in my mind, that we should ignore the problem. So let's get to the problem. Uh, Who's next? It's Liz. Uh, Liz. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Orville. Okay. Liz thanks. did universities and think, think tanks. tanks. So thanks very much, uh, Orville. That was a terrific introduction. And uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the reports, uh, more specific findings around uh, Chinese influence in universities and think tanks. So first, to HR's point, what is really the objective uh, of China's influence uh, uh, efforts uh, in, in these two institutions? And I think uh, there are really three. Uh, the first is very simply to shape a more positive narrative around China, right? Uh, so scholars and universities and think tanks uh, have their voices amplified in uh, China discourse and debate uh, in the United States uh, through their access to the media, through their access to the U.S. government, and of course in their role in educating the American public and the next generation uh, of Americans in, in universities. So it's important from the Chinese government perspective to try to uh, help <laughs> those scholars uh, develop a narrative that uh, perhaps reflects uh, some of China's own perspective. Uh, a second is really to prevent think tanks and universities uh, from providing a forum, uh, I would say, for uh, groups and, uh, and individuals uh, who in some way threaten uh, ideas around Chinese sovereignty. So in particular, maybe Hong Kong democracy activists or uh, senior Taiwan officials or uh, the Dalai Lama in particular, right? So to prevent uh, these institutions from giving these people a place uh, to speak. Uh, and then third, when it comes to uh, university students in particular, I think uh, the Chinese government uh, wants uh, mainland Chinese students uh, studying in American universities uh, to continue to uphold uh, Chinese government uh, values and principles and perspectives uh, at one end and perhaps at the, you know, sort of in the few cases and, and uh, most uh, concerning end, uh, perhaps use uh, positions that they might have in universities to somehow advantage uh, the Chinese government. So let me just tick off, so I think those are the objectives, let me just tick off some of the approaches 
uh, that the Chinese government uh, takes, uh, some of the methods that it has at its uh, disposal. Uh, so first, and I think uh, most uh, noticeably, is really uh, the Chinese government control over visas. Uh, and visas, right, give you the access, give uh, American scholars access to go to China. And for many uh, China scholars and analysts, this is really the lifeblood of their work, right? We go to China uh, to meet with our Chinese colleagues, to attend conferences, to do field research, to access uh, Chinese libraries and, and scholarly archives. Uh, and so, you know, in, in some cases, in the most extreme cases, uh, when people write and say things uh, that the Chinese government finds objectionable, uh, visas can be denied permanently, right? There are American scholars uh, and journalists uh, in this country who haven't been able to travel to China for 30 years uh, because of something that they wrote about Tiananmen. Uh, you know, less extreme cases today, but, but still very concerning are uh, visas that are granted, uh, you know, one time, but not the next time that you want to go. Or uh, there are cases in the report of uh, scholars who are brought into the Chinese embassy or consulate and uh, quizzed and, and interviewed about things that they've written or said. In one case, just a tweet uh, that a, uh, a scholar uh, posted. Uh, she was hauled in uh, before she was uh, granted a visa to explain herself. Uh, there are cases where one person on a delegation is denied a visa, uh, then putting the entire delegation in a quandary. You know, do we go to China, right, minus this one person? This delegation has been six or nine months in the works and a lot of meetings, et cetera, set up. What do we do about this? Uh, so this visa control issue is one way that the Chinese government has of, of indicating to scholars, look, stay on the right side of the line. And sometimes we're not even sure what that line is exactly, uh, but, but we learn very quickly if we've uh, fallen afoul of it. Uh, a second and emerging source of potential Chinese influence is uh, the development of Chinese entrepreneurs and companies uh, who are willing to fund scholarly research on China. Uh, and you know, this is a reasonably uh, new development um, as China has, has grown wealthier and, and many scholars uh, of China do take money uh, from uh, these entrepreneurs and companies and I think by and large are very careful or transparent about how it's uh, being used. Uh, but it can pose a dilemma and let me just give you one example. And this is in fact not an example from the report but it just happened a few weeks ago and I think it's also important uh, for another reason which I'll describe. Uh, so a major U.S. think tank published a report on safe cities, right? So these are cities that use advanced technologies like surveillance technologies uh, to enhance public safety. Uh, and the report was sponsored, was paid for by Huawei. Uh, and the report was transparent in the fact that it was uh, financed by Huawei. But what was not transparent in the report was that a couple of major examples in the report uh, of, of cities that did a very good job in public safety use technologies that are Huawei technologies, right? These are cities that uh, deploy Huawei technologies. What also didn't happen in this report was there was no discussion of the potential for these technologies to be abused, right? So no discussion of how these technologies could be moved into sort of some sort of excessive uh, uh, state, perhaps like Xinjiang. Uh, so, one could rightly ask, you know, did the scholar, who was not a China scholar, let me be clear, but did this scholar, in fact, uh, you know, meet the standards of academic scholarship? You know, on one, at one level, there's, uh, the, it was transparent uh, in the sense that it indicated that Huawei funded it, but beyond that, is there something more that should have happened? So these are the kinds of questions that scholars have to grapple with now when it comes uh, to accepting money from, from Chinese sources. And let me say that this, in fact, is not unique to just China. There are many other countries that do this kind of thing. It is, it is a bigger question, but I think an important one. Uh, let me move more quickly through the rest of these. Um, because I don't want to take too much time. Uh, the third would be access to the Chinese media. You know, look, U.S. China scholars are like U.S. corporations, right? There is a market of 1.4 billion people uh, that can have access to our ideas. It's very exciting. We can publish op-eds. We can go on television. Uh, you know, our books can be translated, and, and you know, the Chinese people can have access to them. All of those things offer the opportunity for uh, Chinese censorship. And when we engage in any of those activities, we are all aware that that is a possibility, that our narrative on China will somehow be distorted by the Chinese media. And scholars take many different uh, approaches to dealing with the Chinese media. I think one interesting case uh, that just came up, uh, you may be aware, was CGTN, the Overseas Chinese Network, uh, was just uh, required to register as a, a foreign agent. 
just a few weeks ago. And all the while, it proclaimed its editorial independence. Well, one of the uh, stories in the report is of a US-China scholar uh, who goes for an interview with CGTN and is told, listen, if you will say more positive things about China, you can come on our show more often, like this person over here who comes on twice a week. By the way, we pay $150 per appearance. Uh, so you can see how it's a very direct effort to influence this China scholars, uh, you know, discussion of China. Right? No matter that CGTN has declared its editorial independence from the government. Uh, a fifth uh, way in which China uh, may begin to shape the narrative in the United States is by establishing uh, Chinese institutions in the United States. So here you could talk about Confucius Institutes uh, on American campuses or the establishment of independent think tanks. So there are now two Chinese think tanks in the United States. Uh, and the report is very clear uh, in terms of our recommendations about transparency and governance. It doesn't say that we should ban these kinds of things, but just that they need to be transparent in their operations and operate under you know, the governance of uh, the institutions in which they're housed. Uh, and then last, uh, again, is this issue of, of students. And I think this is probably the most sensitive, the most pernicious uh, of all. Uh, and, and the idea that uh, Chinese students could be, um, you know, asked to report on other Chinese students in American universities, uh, could be mobilized on behalf of Chinese uh, government uh, politics, uh, or in the extreme again, uh, you know, perhaps to undertake some form of intellectual property theft uh, from university labs. From my perspective, Chinese students are among the most defenseless, and I think this is an issue where I think much more work needs to be done moving forward in terms of figuring out how to help and protect uh, Chinese students uh, from uh, this kind of coercive uh, approach. Uh, finally, our response, and you know, really throughout the report, uh, we have sort of three big recommendations around transparency, integrity, and reciprocity. Uh, you know, transparency, as I mentioned, in terms of the governance structures for uh, Confucius Institutes and think tanks, maintaining the integrity of our institutions. So one of the things we say is if one person in a delegation doesn't get a visa, you cancel the delegation, right? Because that's protecting the integrity of American institution. Um, uh, similarly, when the Chinese government pressures an institution not to host uh, a representative from Taiwan or from, uh, you know, the uh, Tibet uh, attempts to, you know, do something coercive, uh, you obviously don't respond to that, right? You continue to host these people. Uh, and then finally, reciprocity, reciprocity in visas. Uh, you know, U.S. has been granting Chinese scholars 10-year visas. Uh, probably that should stop, uh, and, and we, there should be some sort of reciprocity when, you know, American scholars, uh, you know, oftentimes cannot even get visas. So I'll stop there, but I hope that gives you a flavor for some of the, you know, sort of um, more on-the-ground uh, sort of detailed work that the report offers uh, on this issue. Thanks, Liz. Now, John, on, on the media and the Chinese-American community. Thanks. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Thanks, HR. It's great to be back at Stanford. Um, I spent four of my uh, formative years at this wonderful university in the previous century. Um, I'm, I want to talk about a little bit about the media issue and also about the Chinese influence operations in the Chinese-American community. The way the Chinese view the media uh, scene overseas is they use the term Hua Yujan, which means a war for discourse power, a war to try to control the narrative about China. And that's basically China's key, China's key goal in, 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 in engaging with the media and in pushing out Chinese media to the rest of the world. And China is conducting this war, as it calls it, on two fronts. One in foreign languages in the United States and English, but also in Chinese, in the overseas Chinese media. And I'll talk about both of those. Um, on the English front, pretty much starting in 2008, in the run up to the Olympics, there were a series of free Tibet demonstrations that enraged uh, Chinese at Party Central back in Beijing. And a decision was made the next year to have what the Chinese called a Da Wai Xuan, a major uh, foreign propaganda campaign in which upwards of $7 billion was uh, basically earmarked up front to help Chinese media around the world, not just in the United States, but across the world in seven, actually, uh, international languages to push out China's story, to tell the ch to properly tell China's story, and so that, that China could basically grab back what it called the right to speak 
against what they believed was a Western media domination of the narrative about China. And so you saw the Xinhua News Agency effectively doubling the number of foreign bureaus they had. Uh, in the United States, they doubled their foreign bureaus from three to six. You saw the creation of China Global Television from the, from the Chinese Central Television, which allowed, created a cable network situation where they could be broadcast into the homes of tens of millions of Americans but hundreds of millions of people around the globe. You saw China Radio International leasing radio stations across the globe, but also in the United States to pump out their uh, uh, drive time news to Americans. And you saw China Daily uh, through the China Watch uh, advertisement supplement uh, being appear appearing in American newspapers ar around, around the country. Uh, most notably, actually, the Des Moines Register ran a short one and it, that it basically uh, incurred the ire of President Trump. So, um, at, and, and so finally, this is all coalescing in March of 2018 with the Chinese government deciding to take all of this vast array of foreign-oriented propaganda organizations and merging them into a larger organization called the Voice of China. And I don't know whether the parallel with the Voice of America was intentional, I just, it's ironic to say the least. Um, on the Chinese language front, you see the Chinese being, in fact, much more successful in a way of trying to control the narr a narrative about China in the United States. Thirty some odd years ago, the Chinese language, uh, uh, Chinese language media in America was pretty vibrant. You had pro-KMT publications, pro-Taiwanese -pro publications, pro-Taiwanese independence publications, independent publications, uh, pro-Beijing publications. Now, pretty much. Uh, save for a few publications that are funded and uh, staffed by members of the banned religious sect Falun Gong, and I think one other independent publication. All the other major media outlets that publish in the Chinese language in America are, are representative of, of Beijing. They're either staffed by former editors and reporters from state-run news agencies in China, or they're owned and operated by businessmen with significant business interests in China. So an example would be in the early 1990s, a group of ex of reporters and editors from the China News Service, which is similar to Xinhua, came to America and started up a radio station and a TV station, a uh, 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 newspaper. Uh, and secondly, uh, in terms of digital media, you have very popular digital platforms, Douwei and uh, Wen Xuecheng, which are two of the most popular uh, Chinese digital platforms in America, being recently purchased by businessmen with significant business interests in China. Um, back to Liz's point about reciprocity, uh, no American media company could do what Chinese media companies do in America in China. The um, New York Times website, as we all know, has been banned for years in China. Uh, there are, there's no American electronic media in China other than CNN and hotels in some cities in China. But the reality is that on a reciprocity, reciprocity level, there's a, a wide gap between the freedoms afforded to Chinese media outlets in America to those afforded to uh, Western media outlets in China. In the Chinese American community, um, one of the things that's important to note is that the Chinese government does not look at Chinese Americans or Chinese from other countries as simply citizens with, of, of, of other countries. They're viewed from the Chinese perspective as members of a, the Chinese diaspora which sort of belong to China. The Chinese call them overseas compatriots, Hua Xiao Tongbao which implies that they actually belong to China. China views Chinese Americans in particular, but more broadly Chinese Americans or Chinese overseas as members of, of a worldwide diaspora that, that really should support China and support the goals of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and, and this has a historical background. I mean, for years, the Chinese diaspora overseas played a really outside, outsized role in the Chinese political history. So donations from Chinese Americans in Hawaii laid the foundation for funding the downfall of the Qing Dynasty in 1911 and 1912. The KMT, the Guomindang, which ran Taiwan with an iron fist in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, up until the 1980s, was obsessed with controlling the Chinese American community, and so much so that in 1984, uh, they sent agents to the United States to assassinate a prominent Taiwanese American journalist by the name of Henry Liu in the garage in, in, uh, of, his, of his house just a few miles from here in Daly City. 
Um, as China has, has, has risen and as the Communist Party has strengthened, the Communist Party has embraced the goals in a way of these predecessor governments and has been very focused on trying to increase its control and influence amongst the Chinese Americans as part of a goal to show to the, all Chinese around the world that China and Beijing is the sole uh, locus of authority on all subjects Chinese. Uh, and it's done so, um, and at the same part, they, they also do so at partially in, in sort of in parallel to how they act with the universities, is trying to stop or block any alternative narrative about China, be it Taiwan independence, be it uh, Tibet independence, be it uh, Uyghur pushes for more autonomy in China, be it Chinese democracy, or be it simply an independent view of, of, of China. To do this, Beijing has established a vast bureaucracy uh, in the State Council and also within inside the Communist Party to manage relations with the diaspora, both in the United States and, and, and across the globe. So organizations such as the Overseas Chinese Affairs um, Office of the State Council or the United Front have ba basically have a string of organizations underneath them which carry out party policy. So the organizations such as the China Council for the Promotion of Peaceful National Reunification has 20 um, subgroups in the United States. Organizations such as the Chinese Overseas Exchange Association, Chinese Overseas Friendship Association also have the same, in which a numerous, in fact, hundreds of Chinese Americans have, have been appointed to these positions in these organizations. Over time, the party has ramped up its efforts to include uh, overseas Chinese in these type of organizations. They, they, they are often brought back to China on all expensive paid trips in which they are tasked when they return to their home country of carrying out propaganda exercises on part of the, a part of the government. And this is not sort of secretly done. It's actually these, these appearances of, these, of, of Chinese Americans, but Chinese Australians, Chinese uh, New Zealand, people from New Zealand, are publicized in Chinese media, openly publicized in Chinese language media, in which they say these people have been tasked to return to the home country and to tell China's story. So uh, that's, that's my presence on this. In, I, I'd like to add, actually, to to something that, that Liz and, 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 and Orville um, referred to is that um, I think it's important and that all of us doing this report are really mindful of all the very difficult history that Chinese Americans have had in the United States and the racism that basically started at the time of the gold rush and then was put on steroids during the 1950s in the McCarthyite reds under the bed scare. And, and in doing uh, this part of the report, I, I was very focused not on the very legitimate sense of pride that many Chinese Americans and many Chinese in the United States who are not citizens of the United States have in China's changes. I see that in my own family with my wife being Chinese. The thing that really um, animates this report is the sense that the Chinese government has weaponized the very clear senses of patriotism amongst many Chinese and is trying to use that in a way that um, many of us find inimical to American values. Thank you. John, th thank you very much. Now, Kyle, on, on implications for corporations and businesses. Thank you, HR. Uh, the corporations chapter looked at three main vectors of influence uh, or attempts to influence American society. The first uh, that we looked at were the standing up or the proliferation uh, over the past five years of a number of organizations that purport to be uh, Chinese chambers of commerce or local concerns. When you dig into these groups, what you see, uh, as, as John just mentioned, actually quite openly uh, in, in media and, and on Chinese government websites are interactions between the founders of these uh, chambers of commerce organizations and cities around the U.S. and United Front officials, both in the United States and during re return visits uh, to China. In one case, we were uh, actually able to identify one uh, chamber of commerce that explicitly stated that their uh, formation was as a result of a provincial directive. Uh, and so, whereas John mentioned some of the longer standing groups that have, you know, decades of uh, existence uh, in, in the United States, what's unique about these chambers of commerce is that we're seeing them be stood up in real time, uh, most of them within the past five years. 
The second vector of influence that we looked at is uh, China's use of their own corporations, so nominally private but ultimately beholden uh, to, to the party uh, in their uh, efforts overseas. And so examples of this, and there have been other reporting, uh, for example, uh, the Defense Innovation Unit has a report that's about a year old now, looking at uh, the efforts of Chinese corporations or Chinese venture capital funds and so on uh, to acquire uh, intellectual property developed in this country, not for its commercial value, but to serve a strategic end, uh, and, and pointing that out as a concern within uh, Chinese corporations uh, as a vector of influence are certainly increasing their sophistication uh, in representation in terms of legal means, in terms of funding for lobbying, uh, for example, and participation in some of those groups in Washington. And that's where we were, that's, that's, it's, there's laws there, there's transparency that makes it visible about what they're doing. Uh, but it, in, in our research also flags some areas uh, for concern. Uh, so one of those is the fact that unlike at the federal government where there's a ban on, on foreign contributions to, to campaigns, most states do not have a similar uh, ban on foreign contributions in effect, which would make us uh, just as vulnerable at the local level as some of the incidents that we've seen play out uh, in recent months in, in places uh, like Australia and New Zealand. Uh, there's also ambiguity uh, as it stands about when a Chinese corporation sets up an American subsidiary, uh, under what types of rules are the ways that they can uh, adhere to the letter of the law but still insert money uh, into American politics that I think is something that we warn in the report that we should be vigilant of and, and if necessary we should uh, perhaps clarify uh, what some of those regulations are preemptively. Uh, third, we look at uh, China's attempts to coerce uh, American businesses to advance uh, Beijing's policy interests and they do that because they know that the American business uh, community is influential uh, in American society and American politics and so this manifests in a number of ways. Uh, you'll see very frequently uh, American CEOs are invited uh, to meet with senior uh, Communist Party leaders uh, and effectively again tasked with a set of messaging or outcomes that they want to see them relay back uh, to folks in Washington on penalty uh, that the business businesses that they've built up uh, on the mainland market will be punished if they, they don't do that. The U.S., by contrast, we don't bring Jack Ma or Pony Ma or whoever to, to the White House and tell them to go and tell uh, the Chinese leaders something. And so there's, again, that asymmetry. Uh, we see uh, other attempts uh, to focus specifically on, on business persons as, as a point of concern. There's been an intense interest in recent years in Hollywood, and, and I think that's been an issue that's uh, received lots of coverage, and we devoted a brief case study of China's interest in, in using that vehicle uh, to uh, ad advance China's story or at least uh, preempt or limit uh, um, uh, narratives that would be uh, negative. Uh, and then we've also seen an increase uh, in, in recent uh, months of China's attempts to uh, police corporate speech, uh, specifically with uh, regards to issues like Taiwan. And so you see uh, the punishment of companies like Marriott or the uh, intimidation of American Airlines and, and other airlines around the world in terms of how they reference uh, Taiwan, for instance. Uh, and then, of course, right here in Silicon Valley, because um, many of the, the companies uh, here are, are blocked from offering by the Great Firewall, from offering their services in the mainland, some companies are, have been more obsequious than others in attempting to, to enter that market. And so doing uh, risk legitimating China's, uh, China's vision for cyber sovereignty, uh, which runs counter to, uh, again, a, a, an American vision or of the Internet as, as a decentralized and, and, and open uh, place. So again, the, the, uh, the United Front Organization's use of Chinese corporations here in the U.S. Uh, and then attempts to coerce or pressure U.S. businesses uh, to advance Beijing's interests. Thank you, Kyle. Now, Larry, to pull this together and to talk about some of the recommendations. Thank you, uh, HR, uh, for your interest in this, and thank you all for coming. Um, let me begin by framing this um, in a way that I, I think is quite necessary. And of course, I do this not as a, a China specialist, but who thinks more broadly, uh, comparatively, about regime trajectories and about the way the world is headed. I, I think we need to begin by saying we're no longer in a period um, where we have a rising superpower. 
It has risen. Uh, and I think we now have a world of two superpowers, uh, and we have a China with global ambitions. Uh, in some ways, I think everyone in this room would agree that was inevitable, and in many respects, it's, it's a natural and necessary thing. Uh, and if it was only China projecting soft power, uh, using the kind of transparent methods we do to uh, share its message and competing in world markets, they have every right to do that. And uh, we note in our report um, the many ways China is doing that that are legitimate and we just need to get used to it. And, uh, you know, I'll come back to this in a few minutes, strengthen ourselves. We're in an era of global competition. Um, we have a very dynamic country. It's starting to innovate now in technology. Uh, it's becoming very adroit in uh, projecting its message, as John said, with the uh, voice of China. It's spending more on uh, international broadcasting than we are. Uh, if you don't count the fact that China is delivering most of its foreign aid through uh, <laughs> lending that is at largely commercial rates, which lends, uh, lands developing countries in, I would say, neo-colonial debt traps, then, um, you know, it's giving out more foreign aid than the United States is. This is the world we're in. Uh, many... Uh, China specialists and uh, policy makers say uh, China has every right to do this and it's just another global superpower, one of two, another rightful global player. There's nothing wrong here. <laughs> so what are we talking about? Why is there a problem? And uh, I'm going to begin by mentioning three things that are different here that I think frame everything we're doing and represent a pretty serious problem. One is, not only, this is, it's not just that China's not a democracy, of course, okay? The People's Republic of China is also not just a non-democracy. It's not, uh, you know, uh, Singapore. Uh, and it's not even what China was under Deng Xiaoping, which showed signs of political pluralism, of, you know, desire for some degree of tolerance of openness, particularly before we're approaching now uh, the tragic events of June 4th, 1989, and the crushing of the protests uh, in Tiananmen Square. Even the tentative reopening and signs of pluralism under Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, this is a deeply um, authoritarian regime that is becoming more uh, ideologically uh, and um, uh, intolerantly authoritarian uh, than it was even five, seven, ten years ago. And uh, it is uh, it, the, the, the impulses of this, the ideological um, uh, efforts at control, they may not be very successful, but they're radiating out in many Chinese institutions. The personalization of power under Xi Jinping, the increasing uh, recent assault on human rights lawyers, they've virtually all been put out of business now. So it's not just that we have human rights violations on, a, on a escalating scale in China. We increasingly have no one to defend them because all their lawyers are being put in jail. We have, according to Human Rights Watch, up to one million. Okay, I think the number is probably extravagant. Uh, maybe it's only 100,000. Members of the Uyghur minority in political re-education camps I've been in Tibet. I, I don't know how many people have been there. I don't know how to describe the tragedy that has befallen the people of Tibet, except cultural genocide uh, and an a, a indigenous population there that is living in fear. It's palpable if you visit the temples and walk the streets uh, of that province. And much of China's reaction, John has said, and what prompted the writing of the most influential book doc documenting this uh, in Australia is the way China has reacted to people expressing concern about what's happened in Tibet. In addition, we have something that is new uh, in the history of the world, 
and I think represents a unique threat to freedom in the world. And that is the merger of this renewed impulse uh, at control and reassertion of the pervasive domination of the Chinese Communist Party and the fusion of the party and the state with high technology and the creation very rapidly, it is coming on stream, of the Orwellian surveillance state with 200 million surveillance cameras as Liz notes in her forthcoming article in the Journal of Democracy and uh, three times that slated to be uh, on the streets within two years. Uh, and these supercomputers that are taking everyone's social media data, data biometric data, uh, and other imprints of thought and activity and distinctiveness, and meshing them all into one uh, super uh, control database that will enable the party state to compute a social credit score of not only law abidingness, okay, well, that's nice that we don't want uh, people jaywalking, uh, but of loyalty to the Chinese Communist Party state, which will determine uh, if their kids are going to get into the best universities, if they're even going to get a passport, if they can buy a train ticket. This is the political system that is projecting power in the United States, in Australia, in New Zealand, in Europe, in Latin America, in Africa today, not only in transparent ways, but to quote a leader who I think will go down in history as a very significant um, uh, uh, you know, agent of democratic defense in Australia, the former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, using methods that do not fall into the category of soft power, that we call in our report at the National Endowment for Democracy sharp power because they are, to for quote the former Prime Minister, covert coercive and or corrupting. The second thing, uh, and here we have a, um, a very important section in our appendix that diagnoses the vast influence bureaucracy of the Chinese Communist Party state, uh, is that this is really vast. It's, it, it's an enormous architecture in terms of the range of both party and state institutions that, that compose the larger ar architecture of United Front influence projection uh, with all the money and uh, focus that's embedded in that. And then the outer wall of um, co-option that, um, that comprises that. And now I will say, this can be debated, but I think my China scholars on this uh, panel will, um, uh, will agree with this statement, that there is another element of distinction between the way the People's Republic of China operates and between the way it's even putatively private think tanks and private enterprises engage abroad and the way that private enterprises and private think tanks and non-governmental organizations um, from North America, Europe, e even now Brazil uh, en engage. There is no def legally defensible uh, and legally secure and politically sustainable wall of separation between a Chinese corporation and the Chinese government between a Chinese think tank that says, hey, we're not part of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. We're an independent think tank and the party state. If the party state says to the company that bought uh, the largest gay dating site in the world, Grindr, uh, in 2017, 2018, hand that data over to us. Uh, is there anyone that really thinks that company can, under the rules and methods of operation of um, uh, the People's Republic of China, say, no, we're a private company, you can't have it. 
which may explain why uh, HR, uh, you know, if you'll permit me to say so, the American intelligence community that maybe historically has not been the greatest friend of, of gay rights in the United States of the world, is deeply concerned about this and about the compromise of individual privacy and individual rights that is coming down the pike as more and more Chinese companies, even if they are private, buy access to uh, people's private data and buy access to the latest forms of technology, which brings me to the third backdrop, which is that China is now, please correct me if I'm wrong, HR, the second largest spender in terms of uh, military in the world, the one that's uh, expanding the most rapidly in its military, and the one that has declared, bring us, you know, every piece of our society uh, possible, um, as much technology as you can. Bring us the People's Liberation Army. Um, and so the problem with technology is that many of the most exciting technologies in the world today, in robotics, in uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, in supercomputing, in semiconductors, even in gene editing, are dual-use technologies, and they can be used to transform human right, life and uh, human communication and human well-being and human longevity, or they can be used in the new generation of war fighting that unfortunately is rapidly evolving. Uh, and again, I would not be as concerned if this technology was not being acquired by means fair and foul, including cyber theft and coerced transfers of technology by corporations in order to have the privilege of doing business in the Chinese market, uh, if it were being acquired by a country that was reasonably transparent, if not a democracy, at least at the level of openness of Singapore, that is not the nature of the Chinese uh, regime today, the People's Republic of China. And it is being acquired at a moment when this regime is increasingly breaking free of international rules, swallowing up territory that is, I think, under international law, not theirs in the South China Sea, and alarming most of its Southeast Asian neighbors. So the next question is, what is the evidence of impact? Many of our critics have said, you don't show anything. OK, in Australia, we found there was a politician who had uh, been paid by a Chinese businessman to make sympathetic statements about um, uh, China's claims to the South China Sea. Uh, and there are other evidence of more blatant uh, you know, impact in China and New Zealand, and I'd say some other developing post-communist countries. What's your evidence in the United States? Well, let me uh, highlight some of what's been said. Um, it's not that now we see American policy just caving in uh, to uh, what the way the, uh, the leadership of the People's Republic of China sees things, but I think it's an impact when American China scholars, even American China scholars who have been involved in our working group, say that they engage in self-censorship to some degree because they know it could affect their ability to get visas to go back to China. I think it's an impingement on the pluralism and freedom of our society when universities are being punished, as some American universities have been, or threatened by the Chinese government for hosting the Dalai Lama or events that are very critical of its behavior in, um, in Tibet. I think it's a worry when an American filmmaker who told me personally that he was induced and persuaded uh, by his um, uh, you know, Hollywood company to write out of the film his protagonist being a lesbian and in a lesbian relationship because he was told he couldn't sell that film in China if it had that plot construction. Um, I think that it is a problem when members of the um, Chinese uh, diaspora community, uh, Chinese American uh, uh, members, but also people who have recently 
settled here, uh, Chinese students here, are worried about um, saying things, being heard to say things, and we have reports across many American classrooms of being heard to say things, even in the classroom, that are critical of their government for fear that it'll get back, their parents could be pressured, they could be punished. Uh, I've had many people come to me in hushed tones, including in the last 48 hours, uh, expressing these kinds of uh, concerns. Now let me say, I want to close. Uh, I'll have two more things to say, but I want to have this closing set of comments reiterate what John said and what Orville said, because it's been a very emotional, I will be honest in saying, an effusive uh, set of concerns that many members of the Chinese American community who we know, who we care about, who are friends, who we respect, are worried about uh, that they will become uh, targets. We just had, I'm not going to be uh, mince words here, we just had a very challenging and spirited section, uh, session on Monday uh, discussing this report where one of our, our critics put up a slide. Uh, it shocked me. I was completely unaware of the publication of this article and in Foreign Policy Magazine, no less, uh, of an article asking the question, could Chinese Americans be interned as Japanese Americans were in a future conflict between China and the United States. That this question could even be asked, I, I found shocking. Uh, and to have a slide with the internment camps uh, in a public session like this, I found really quite alarming. So uh, let me say, if there's the slightest doubt about this, because there are, on the nativist, I'm going to be blunt here, right in the United States, I'd say some, some dangerous, loose talk about um, who's loyal and who's not and all of this. And we completely disavow this. Uh, and uh, if there's any doubt about it, we are going to you know, write the disavowal uh, even more um, passionately into the book version uh, of this report. Uh, we, uh, I think, are united in feeling uh, that the, the, the distinction of America and what will be our asset in both the legitimate and more challenging dimensions of the global era of competition that's upon us between two superpowers is our diversity. Uh, and if we don't embrace that, if we don't appreciate that, and if we don't defend that, we will not only betray our own ideals, but we will um, not be uh, as effective as we should be. So let me cl close with a few uh, policy bullet points. Number one, um, I would say there's a, there's a substantial class of ways that the United States needs to respond to the challenges that the People's Republic of China uh, is posing legitimate and illegitimate, that are on us. We need to strengthen ourselves, okay? Part of it, yes, we need to close off um, inappropriate uh, forms of technology misappropriation through pressure on our corporations, cyber hacking, uh, industrial espionage, and so on. That goes out without saying. But we also need to increase funding uh, federal funding for research and development. A major um, recommendation of the Defense Innovation Unit's more detailed uh, report on Chinese technology transfer. If we are concerned, and it's not the leading concern in our report about universities, if we're concerned about having the Chinese Ministry of Education organized through the Confucius Institutes, the teaching of uh, Chinese language in so many colleges and universities in the United States, and fund them with their own textbooks and their own instructors. And by the way, uh, a member of our working group has carefully reviewed the published curriculum and doesn't find really much to worry about there in terms of propaganda. But if we're concerned 
then let's have a new National Defense Education Act where the federal government will step up and help uh, American universities teach critical languages, uh, including uh, Chinese. So there's a lot we need to do to just strengthen ourselves and become more efficient. But we also need to uh, uh, do three more things that comprise what we argue is a strategy of constructive, responsible, careful vigilance. Number one, transparency. More transparency, for example, in foreign funding of universities and think tanks. And in the Confucius Institute contracts, by the way, most of which are not open to scrutiny, not only by the publics, but even by the faculty of the institutions where they exist. And that concerns us more than the substance of the curriculum. Um, so, uh, more transparency in all natures of the relationships. And if a Chinese provincial or city association is going to come and say to an American community, we want an exchange program with you, well, fine. But let them clearly identify who they are, which often doesn't happen. Uh, they have ties to the United Front apparatus that are not disclosed. And let the terms of the relationship be very transparent. For preserving integrity, um, we've got a lot of things that Liz has spoken to uh, in relation to universities that were mentioned in terms of an obvious thing. It's illegal for a foreign government or entity to contribute uh, money to a federal election campaign. It ought to be illegal to do so. I don't care if it's China, Saudi Arabia, uh, or Mexico, you know, no foreign government or entity, I think, should contribute to an American election campaign at any level. I want to say about visas, because it's a very controversial issue uh, now, that again, if we embrace diversity, the right approach is to have as, you know, to carefully vet who might be coming from anywhere to work in a technologically sensitive American laboratory, and if they're not affiliated with an intelligence or military apparatus, bring them here, and then keep them here, and have them contribute to the dynamism of our society. Uh, and finally, we have the element of reciprocity, um, which Liz has spoken to uh, with universities. And I'll just say a final word about uh, media, which I keep uh, harping on because it just seems so obvious to me. If China television, global television, can uh, broadcast on our cable uh, networks, which is fine. I'm not sure many people watch it, but you know, let them do it. Why can't CNN and Fox News and MSNBC and PBS and whoever have access to the Chinese uh, cable airwaves? It just seems the most basic element of reciprocity. Thank you, HR. Thank you, Larry. And, and thanks for framing this in context of uh, the competition, I think, as we're recognizing between an authoritarian closed system and our free and open system, and with the recognition that we can't compromise what are the strengths of our free and open system as we craft a response. So I, what I'd like to do without any further delay is open it up for your questions. And again, if you could please keep it very succinct. And, uh, and we'll begin, sir, with you right here in the second row. There's a mic coming. There's a mic com coming. There it is. I picked the, the longest trip for you to make with the microphone. Hi, my name is Buck G, and I'm a member of the Asia Society Advisory Committee and uh, also a member of the Committee of 100. And I have a comment and a question uh, for, um, for Larry. Uh, first, I want to read just a sentence from the paper for those who haven't read the paper. Uh, it goes like this. It, it is imperative that Chinese Americans not be subjected to the kind of generalized suspicion or stigmatization that could lead to racial profiling. However, China's influence activities have collectively helped throw the crucial relationship between China and the United States into a state of imbalance and antagonism. Now, I see that as personally offensive because what it says is we should not stereotype, although there may be reasons to do so. So the use of all, all however, is really a, a, a rhetorical device to make a statement, a conclusion. 
And, and that, that really flows through most of the paper, a framing of yes, but. And so I can give you an example of a sir, statement. Sir, can you just be a little bit faster? Okay, just sorry. Like first for so I'll make else. a quick statement, and then I'll, is my question. So I can say as a statement, Larry, I would never call you racist. However, <laughs> so the paper has that framework. My question to you, because you said you would disavow statements, that suggests, in fact, that you should stereotype. Are you willing to disavow this paper? Because it does that. Well, as somebody who's read the whole paper, I just don't I think that's the intent. But let me ask John to respond to that, and then I'll ask Larry. So, or anyone on the panel who wants to. Since it's about yeah, the I, I, I don't. I think that the, the point of the, the, the whole report, and in particular the point on the, on the Chinese Americans, is that the Chinese Americans cannot be blamed for their legitimate pride in China. The issue is that the Communist Party has attempted to use that pride to carry out party policy and to in the United States. And I think that's the, the, the point of the whole section on Chinese Americans. So I don't, I don't, uh, I disagree with your. Larry, would you have anything you'd like to say in response also? Well, I mean, in the report, yes. I mean, it does, you know, a, a large number of Chinese Americans have taken positions and have accepted positions in organizations uh, that are founded and controlled by the United Front Department in Beijing. And the report throws out as a potential the fact that these people should, you know, consider being, re being registered as, as agents of a foreign power because they are effectively having taken positions in organizations that while registered in the United States as NGOs are in reality uh, operated and controlled by the United Front Department organizations in Beijing. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? We'll take, let's take, uh, let's take two or three, and I'll keep track of them. So for, for the lady here in the front, and then we'll take you in the far back there, and then, and then right here uh, close. So we'll do three in a row. Hi, so uh, my name is Wei Chun, Chun. I'm an immigrant from China more than 30 years ago. I've been an American citizen for more than 26 years. Um, I have uh, some comments and question. My, my comments goes how, oh, my question goes, how much effort did the author put into Checking, checking the facts. Um, there are some basic facts got wrong, and then they use rumor to support their position. I found, I did read the report, I found it surprisingly and disappointingly biased. Specifically, there's a paragraph about Wen Xuecheng, that you mentioned. Uh, Wen Xuecheng in English is Wen Xue City. The paragraph uh, implies that Wen Xue City is being uh, controlled by China. Uh, although it uh, correctly pointed out that the owner of the Wen Xuecheng, Wen Xue City, is Wayne Lin, he's a Taiwanese American, and uh, he is here today. He would like to ask questions and also to rebut the rumor and the misstatements of facts. There are many misstatements of facts in that paragraph to set the record straight. That's Wayne. Thank okay. you. And second question in the far back. Yes. Wait. But I'm not here for a question. Uh, I'll, I'll come back yeah. to you. I'll come back to you. Okay. So, yes, yes. Well, I, um, I read the report when it first came out because that's things I'm really concerned of. And I'm Chinese American. I, when I read the report, I think the report went out its way to say this is not about the racial profiling. We should uh, uh, distinct the party state of CCP and, and the Chinese people. So that's very clear. That's one thing. The second thing is when I read the report, I thought of that, you know, finding is actually very, very, in a way, moderate, because I heard more. And it's particularly in business sector, uh, you know, all these corporations, it's not just a chamber of commerce or ask them to lobby, uh, you know, the uh, White House. It's really, it's about uh, self-censoring when you want to access this market. You know, the corporation, naturally, they just self-censor, they shut up, they close their eye, they turn their, you know, look the other way. So I feel the report actually is very reasonable, moderate, very balanced. And uh, I'm very glad it says very clear, it's not about uh, racial profiling. I'm a Chinese American, I have no issue with that. Great, th thank you. 
Yes. Uh, right here. The front. Hi, my name is Terkan Hacalol. I'm a Turkish American, and I have a question about actually. Um, in a broader sense, I've seen that you selected some of the countries um, when you talk about the Chinese influence in the world and you basically chose um, Asia Pacific countries and the West Europe uh, countries. I'm curious to learn the reason um, why you selected these countries and not others. For example, we know that China has a lot of influential activities in the Middle East, in Africa, uh, in you know, South America. Um, is this kind of an underlying, there is, is there an underlying thought that since we have two global powers now that we're leaving some part of the world to China and we're keeping some of it to <laughs> okay. ourselves? Mm -hmm. And if so, does this um, show some kind of a defensive move on us? Um, if this is not the thought of the panel, can we say anything about this? Um, it's common in Washington, D.C. So just to recap, I'm going to ask who on the panel would like to discuss these. The first is has to do with research mes methods and and uh, and the degree to which ch facts were checked and and and, uh, and so forth. The second is about is the report too moderate? Uh, did you, were, were your recommendations strong enough given the, the scope of it and and, and the assessment that it, it was did not engage in in any kind of advocacy for racial profiling? And then the third question is the scope of of the appendix that looks at. Uh, at, at Chinese influence in other countries and, and uh, what are opportunities for further research or why did you scope it that way? So, so. Which direction do you want to go in? So uh, what, I, what I'd like to do is just uh, ask, I think because so much of this involves the Chinese American community, maybe ask John to comment on your, on your research techniques and, and, uh, and the sources you consulted and so forth. Well, to the extent that I could, um, I've tried to be as factual as possible. I appreciate your point. Um, I'm, you know, not, uh, I, I, and, and throughout, I think not just simply in, in, in the Chinese American section, but throughout the report, I think all of us were extremely vigilant about trying to be as moderate as possible. An example would be, you know, Senator Mark Rubio has basically urged the banning of Confucius Institutes around the country, whereas this report take, that does not uh, take a position on that. In fact, it doesn't look at the Confucius Institute as an issue other than for a transparency question. So. Um, and I would like to meet with you um, and, and speak. So. Great. Uh, Orville, would you, and Larry, would you mind commenting on opportunities for further research and, and maybe uh, from the Asia Society perspective, in particular, Orville, how you see Chinese uh, Communist Party influence operating outside of the United States? Well, what's so interesting about the way in which uh, the United Front strategies manifest themselves abroad is a great varieties of experience. And you're absolutely right. I mean, we had limited resources, so we couldn't just survey the whole globe. So we did New Zealand, Australia, Singapore, Japan, Canada, Britain, France, and Germany. And I mean, I do think there's a myriad other utterly fascinating examples, and Turkey is one of them, but certainly Africa is replete with other examples of how China is interacting with these countries. And I think it's a very important study, and I think someone ought to do it. Can uh, I just add one thing yeah. on this? And actually, so I mentioned this to Larry, um, you don't know yet, Orville, but actually I am pursuing uh, another study that looks, um, it'll be based with workshop in Cairo and, and another one in South Africa. Uh, so to get at, uh, to some extent, your point, to try to understand uh, Chinese influence more broadly in, in those places. So, so there's an expression. It's already in, in your mind. In there's, our there's mind. an expression in Chinese, you know, Shuo Cao Cao, Cao Cao Zhou Dao. You speak of the General Cao, and then suddenly General Cao appears. So here we have the answer to your, to your question. So I'm, I'm pleased to uh, give the floor to someone else. Uh, Larry. I, I need to respond to Mr. Chi um, uh, because you know, your statement is a very important one. And um, I think it reflects how you know, different people can see and hear things with different eyes and come to completely different inferences. Um, so when we write, wrote the whole paragraph, which I found and I'm going to have to read now, 
Um, you know, it never occurred to us that someone like you would interpret it in that way. When you read um, the excerpt you read, it never occurred to you, I, I, I'm, I, I'm really certain of it, that I would think you were taking this out of context and misrepresenting what the however meant. But now I'll tell you the way I think you did that. We say it's important not to exaggerate the threat of these new Chinese initiatives. And then we, say, we have three sentences. China has not sought to interfere in a national election in the US the way Russia has done. For all the tensions in the relationship, there are deep historical bonds of friendship, cultural exchange, and mutual inspiration. And it's imperative that Chinese Americans not be subjected to generalized suspicion and stigmatization, and so on. However, and the however refers to the whole paragraph, not to just the last sentence. However, I realize that given the sequence, which is that the however follows the last sentence, you could reasonably have the interpretation you did. Therefore, when we publish this as a book, which we're you know, getting close to doing, and thus these two sessions, Monday and today, are extremely helpful to us in this regard, I see that we will have to remove that however, so readers like yourself don't draw you know, an inference which we did not intend, and I think which, if you read the whole paragraph, one could come to a different conclusion. But I will say as well that we are in the process of finishing some modest revisions of this for book form. If anybody has any suggestions or concerns about changes they think would uh, you know, mitigate the concern you have, feel free to email them to, the, to us. We would welcome them. So let me just say that however you may choose to construe this, please believe us, we're on your side. We don't want to see a pogrom. We're not out to. I live in a household that speaks Chinese. My kid speaks Chinese. My, my wife is Chinese. I mean, listen, I live this at home. I live it in politics. I live it in my professional life. I, I, I don't want to see us go where you're afraid we're going to go. But this is a challenge America has to confront every time it, it faces up to a challenge. Can it be you know, judicious enough? and temperate enough to answer a problem without demonizing people. Maybe we can't. I'm going to try to get in one more round of three questions. But before I, I do that, I just want to ask Liz, because the, the first questioner in the group of three, you mentioned that you've been here for 30 years. You've been a citizen for 26 years. Your book, Liz, really covers this transitional period in this third revolution, from a period of reform in the post-Maoist period to this period of taking center stage in the policies of Xi Jinping. I, I, for those of you who've been here for 30 years, I thought you might benefit from Liz's perspective on what she sees as different with United Front operations, Chinese Communist policy operations here in the United States. And then, and then Colm is going to ask you if you have any comments, particularly on the second questioner who mentioned that she's most concerned about the activities in the business sector, if you have any response to that. And then we'll get to three more questions. But Liz? Can I do that yeah. at the end? Can I sure. Can just yeah. do that at the okay. end? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So Liz, will do it at the end. Kyle, anything the you'd end. like yeah. to say before we uh, ask for three more questions? I, I would say we're constantly learning uh, every day of, of new examples and, and, and new uh, tough choices that uh, not just American corporations but corporations all around the world are facing. Uh, the, the impulse on one hand to pursue the opportunities uh, on the mainland, but the risks that start to come flow back with some of those profits. And, and it's something that we're absolutely mindful of and, and we continue to learn more about. Okay, so we're, take, we're going to take three more. We're going to go to the far back, to the lady in the far back. This gentleman here in the, on the right, we're going to do four. How about that? This gentleman who I promised, and then this gentleman in the, in the corner. OK, so we'll do it in that order. I'm going to take notes. Pay attention. OK. Hi, I'm Yasmin. I'm a sophomore at Stanford. So I just want to say thank you for raising awareness um, to the way that universities fall prey to Chinese-seeking, um, Chinese-influence-seeking activities. My question is, are college campuses, including Stanford's university administration, aware of this threat? And are they doing anything about it? Um, 
In particular, are they doing anything to address the vulnerability of Chinese international students and the threat of intellectual property thre um, theft? Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you. And the second, second question? We're here, sir. And we'll need a microphone up here for the third. Yes. Yes, my name is Wen Lin, and uh, I've been an uh, American citizen over almost 30 years. And uh, originally from Taiwan, I'm a Chinese from Taiwan. And I'm the CEO of uh, WinchinCity.com. And uh, I'm the person that John just mentioned uh, in your report on the media section. And uh, I think the, by reading the report, I'm here to uh, sort of like helping the, uh, this report be more correct and more credible to the public. And I think uh, as a person that mentioned, and then also my website mentioned in the report, mentioned four things. First thing is our website name, which is wrong already. If reader follow the link on the report, it's going to be 404. It's no website there because the spell is wenxuechen.com. I think any audience, if it happened to be uh, uh, wenxuecity.com's reader, everybody know that wenxuecity.com's domain name. That's number one. Number two, you mentioned that uh, we have a long time contract with the Xinhua News. Sure, I'm sorry, we're not going to have time for this. Sure, so if, sure. You would, if you're able to write that up, I know in the revision process they'd be happy to look, yes. happy to look at it. But do you have a question for the panel? I have a question is how do you drive this research to come, with, come up with a report to mention uh, websites uh, like us? And uh, there's a lot of bias in there. And I also mentioned, most importantly, we have a reader already spread out. Don't come to this website to post any, any, uh, post, any post, any article, because we are Communist Party controlled. You know, I have never received any penny from the government of China and any agency. I have never signed any I'm news sure, I'm contract. I'm sure they'd be happy to, 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 to yes, please. entertain yeah. your rebuttal that's to I'm, that. That's what I'm here for. OK, great. I want Thank to make clear Thank on you. that. Thank so you. So we'll we have one question here in the front and then over here in the corner. I wanted to thank the panelists for making this available. I think this is a very important report on a very important issue. And the weight of history is on your shoulders and my shoulder and everyone else's shoulder to make a democratic discussion based on facts and based on reasons. So I wanted to ask a question regarding the dissenting opinion by one of your working group members who is not here today, uh, Assistant Deputy Secretary of State uh, under the Obama administration, Susan Shirk. Uh, I happen to know Susan uh, through my activity with the Israel Society, so uh, I have tremendous respect for her. I wanted to read uh, an excerpt from her dissent so that the audience uh, would hear it as well, so that people know that this is not, this does not represent me, all the 23 me, members. This, this dissent, I just want to let you know, this is in the publication, so if you want to skip reading it and just, do you have a question or uh, we could read all sorts of different sections from the report. Yeah, I just want to read the okay. first, first sentence yeah. and the last sentence. How's that? Okay. Okay. okay thank right. you. Sure. I respectfully dissent from what I see as the report's overall inflated assessment of the current threat of the Chinese influence seeking in the United States. And the last sentence says, I believe the harm that we could cause our society by our own overreactions is actually greater than, the than that caused by the Chinese influence seeking, period. Uh, another observation I saw was, you know, Mr. McMaster, you said at the very beginning that this is an impeccable, impeccable analysis, impeccable, perfect analysis. But I think this report took more than one year of work, which is amazing. But I'm a little bit surprised that uh, some of the authors did not even care to interview the subject of the report, including the CEO, who I don't even know. I have never met. I am an avid reader of Winchester City. My wife criticized me for not talking to her instead of reading the Winchester City. And their amazing political dissent 
I thought that this is funded by the Taiwanese government. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, sir. I'm not so, to stop and there also there's and no so survey, no question. data. Thank you for your point. Thank you for your point. I will and also, the there's no survey, no yes. data by a scholar, scholarly report. So anyhow, I wanted to hear okay. your right. answers. We need a separate paddle with you on it, I think. OK, <laughs> let's, let's go ask, uh, see if we have a question. Thanks. I have a simple question. Just, um, and it relates to all the emotion we've heard uh, in some of the other questions. It's just, how did the title get made? Um, Chinese, you, you could have chosen Chinese influence. You, you, you obviously did choose Chinese influence. Chinese is, refers to people uh, as compared to China's, C-H-I-N apostrophe S influence. That's OK, great. All right, so I think what we'll do in the interest of time is we will ask the panel to address some of the points. The first, the first question had to do with campuses. What do you think is appropriate to, you know, to counter? Uh, what could be uh, activity on campuses that is, that is not in keeping with the mission of our universities uh, and, uh, and our, our free and open societies? Uh, the second had to do with uh, the web, this, this particular website and uh, a perception of bias against this website in a way that did not represent the content on it. That was actually, I think, your point as well, sir. Uh, the third, the third uh, really had to, had to do with the, the reading of the dissenting opinion, which is, which is available there. And I think the point made there was a point very consistent with what you've heard the panel make already, uh, which is their concern as well about, uh, about overreactions. And then finally, the question about the title. So rather than address each of these, I'd like you to maybe integrate any responses to these into maybe a two-minute final closing remark. And, uh, and I think it might, it might be easiest just to go in the same order that we began with, with Orville, if you wouldn't mind taking it. Um, well, as to the title, uh, you know, any group of 20 people you're trying to figure out what to call something. I can tell you it's, 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 it's a complicated process. It may not be the best title in the world, but it wasn't as if there was one very artful soul got to, to dec decree what the title was. So uh, forgive us. Um, as to the dissent by Susan Shirk, uh, some of you may know I also co-chair with Susan Shirk the task force in US China policy. And we just released our report on overall China policy in Washington and New York two days, the last two days. Um, and Susan uh, is a very wonderful scholar person, uh, friend of all of ours. And she was having many concerns such as we've heard expressed here tonight. And Larry and I said, well, for Susan, for heaven's sakes, put them in the report. Uh, let's include them. We should have this discussion. As you said, we need a good, good democratic, open uh, society discussion. So she did. Now, I think you could talk to her. And it's, she didn't disagree with what the report said. And she didn't disagree with the, 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 the challenge of, of mapping what we tried to map about how China seeks influence. What she was very concerned about was the response, the reaction, and the lack of confidence that we as a people would be able to respond to this challenge in a way that was fair and, 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 and judicious. And she wrote what she wrote, and I'm so glad she did, because here you all are, and we're talking about it. Thanks, Orville. Liz? OK, so you know, I, I'm happy to talk about the bigger picture of Chinese uh, influence and uh, you know, Xi Jinping's effort to you know, uh, sort of move towards center stage and the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation and, and the way that he has you know, put forward the idea that uh, the rest of the world, in particular developing countries, can learn from the Chinese model and what that means in terms of export of Chinese values and control over the internet, et cetera. I mean, there's, that's a huge discussion. Uh, but actually, I wanted to address the point of, of data in survey in the report and say that actually if you read through the report, which I take it you have, you find that each chapter approaches that somewhat differently. Uh, in the university chapter, for example, there's a rich secondary literature, so it relies primarily on that. Uh, in, the sec in the think tank chapter, uh, I can tell you that was done with, through exclusively, really, through interviews uh, with 17 uh, China scholars uh, at think tanks. And it was really all of their input uh, that 
the Fed, that chapter. Uh, you know, others, I think, like corporations, there's a mix of, of sort of firsthand uh, interview data and uh, secondary literature. So each chapter uh, used what was available, used what the author felt was most appropriate to uh, the, the topic at hand. Um, you know, maybe there should be a different mix in some of them, and I think people can address that, but uh, I think it's, it's not really fair to say that there's no data and there's no research and there's no, you know, interview, you know, survey work done because there is. Thanks, Liz. John? Um, so, uh, directly to, to Mr. Wayne Lynn, I'm, I'm happy you came today. Um, you know, part of the whole process of trying to understand this issue is, as Deng Xiaoping said, you know, it's feeling the, feeling, crossing the river by feeling the stones. So, I look forward to meeting you if you have time after this and um, to correct any errors I might have included in my report about you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. But Kyle. as what for what, but more broadly, I mean, this is a, a sort of a, all of this is a work in progress, and I think that the very legitimate worries that, that for example, Buck initially expressed about uh, anti-Chinese racism are really important. But similarly, trying to figure out this beast of Chinese influence operations in the United States is also important too. And there's got to be a way, as Orville said, for us to be able to marry both of those things and to try to uh, continually to be vigilant against uh, anti-Chinese racism and also errors in our report at the same time as to try to understand this new, this brave new world that we're entering with China. So. Thanks, John. Kyle? I uh, want to specifically address the, the question about uh, university campuses as uh, the millennial representative, if you will, of, 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 of this report and as someone who's still on a college campus. I think uh, even though many colleges uh, in, in this country have struggled and in some cases failed outright in terms of, on one hand, willing to, to bring Chinese students and take their money, uh, uh, but have failed to socially integrate them uh, on our campuses and bring them into the fullness of, of the academic experience. Uh, it's, it's a, on one hand, on the strategic level, it's a, it's a great uh, failure for American soft power that we haven't done that better. What I would say as a student and as someone who tries to do this in my own life, that even if, if college administrations struggle with that, that doesn't mean that we can't, as students, be more proactive in reaching out to our Chinese peers and trying to engage with them and try to make up and, and bring them into the fullness of the fabric. And that includes not just trying to exchange our values, it, it includes listening too. Thank you, Carl. Larry. Uh, well, thank you all very much for coming and for your comments. And I say again, we, we welcome more comments. My, <laughs> at some risk of uh, being overloaded, my email address is ldiamond at stanford.edu. It's very simple. <laughs> and so if you have any uh, further criticisms or uh, recommendations you'd like to make, uh, please email them. Let me just say I've now been in multiple panels, uh, public panels, uh, to this week, and many private conversations where people have both expressed praise and appreciation, and those who have, I'd like to thank you for that, uh, and a heartfelt and sincere uh, criticism. I have yet to hear criticism that really drives to the fundamental points we're making, um, that you have a deeply, uh, aggressively, uh, authoritarian regime in China that is much more authoritarian than it used to be, much more technologically sophisticated and ambitious than it used to be, that is not just trying to do what the United States has tried to do for many decades through its public di uh, diplomacy and public um, uh, broadcasting to get its story out, but is trying to, we use this language in our report, control the narrative. That's a very different, different thing. It speaks to a, an authoritarian mentality and an effort to eclipse and, and threaten and narrow pluralism and dialogue and civic space. And this is what is happening, has long since, of course, happened in China. It is what has happened in many places in the world where you now have, it's apparent from our case study of Australia, uh, many people have been writing about it, you cannot drive through Australia and hear anything on Chinese language radio except the PRC line. Uh, and even if there's a little bit of pluralism in uh, the Chinese language uh, uh, print and, and electronic uh, media left in the United States, 
no one has refuted the big story, which is it's a lot less than it used to be. And that's a worrisome thing uh, for freedom for those members of American society who get some or most of their information via Ch Chinese language media. I'm going to close by mentioning someone I haven't talked to yet, uh, uh, mentioned yet, who was also a member of our working group, Hoover Research Fellow Glenn Tifford, who's sitting over there, who will also have an article uh, in the forthcoming issue of the Chinese, uh, of the Journal of Democracy, on what China uh, has been doing to suppress historical memory. Let me mention two things. First of all, the fortunately, but this will not be the last attempt, of the People's Republic of China to try to induce a major uh, academic publisher, namely uh, Cambridge University Press, to delete uh, from its online offer, offering certain articles that were um, uh, critical of China in order to be able to have its offerings uh, in China. Fortunately, they stood their ground and refused. But they're trying to even censor academic publications. And as Glenn notes, there's a compendium of Chinese language uh, publications uh, and, and scholarly journals and so on in China that represents the precious historical record of um, what's been written and, and uh, studied and researched in China. The Chinese Communist Party state, as it digitizes all this information, is eliminating prior, am I getting your story right yet? Prior is scholarly articles that they think don't reflect the party line. If, God forbid, all of the remaining repositories of the print versions uh, of these journals and of Ch Chinese thinking, analysis, scholarship in China um, get rid of their print versions, this will be permanently purged from the record. What kind of government does these things. That's what I would like you to leave this auditorium asking yourself. Well, I'd just like to say in closing, thanks to everybody for coming, especially on Valentine's Day. We heard, we heard, we heard uh, really very little dissent about the problem. We had grave concern about what we do in terms of, of a solution to that problem or a way to address the challenge, and, and that's why we all need to work together. So thank you very much.